Thanks so much, Liz, and, and thanks so much for the, the platform here. So my, my whole idea behind this and why I want to do this is I want to create more positive conversation, but really dialogue and, and really questions and answers um, about regenerative or sustainable organic, organic cannabis growing. And even more interesting to me, uh, converting to that if you're not currently there. Um, I wanted to put together a series of people that I thought were really good at this topic. And so today I brought together um, three panelists. Two will be joining us shortly. They got held up, but uh, our first panelist will really not need much of an introduction. Gangier Council Member and Instructor Wendy Kornberg, second generation legacy uh, cultivator managing Sunibus. Um, we all know Wendy really well. We've seen her on our videos or met her in person and um, certainly someone that can talk in a lot of detail about soil, outdoor soil, and specifically KNF. Our second panelist who will also be joining us uh, momentarily, James Buer. Uh, James has been an organic gardener for many years, but also transitioned to organic gardening from, from hydroponics. He uh, more recently joined his fiance Wendy at Sonibus as farm manager, and uh, he runs the Organic Cultivar Cultivators website and Facebook group, which is a, an amazing educational platform. Their mission is to educate consumers, growers, farmers, uh, and general people on their generative agricultural systems and shift our food and medicine uh, away from the current model to a um, positive paradigm saving the planet. And then very excitingly, and here for me, is uh, Tim Hanrahan. Tim is the proprietor for Love Light Medicinals in Maine, an indoor living soil medical cannabis producer and manufacturer. Tim has been continuously using the same soil for about 12 years with better results each cycle. Recognized as an expert in building and maintaining soil health, Tim is an admin for the Organic Cultivators Group, uh, where his website uh, features his soil recipe. And uh, he has published very various articles on the topic, including for the Northeast Organic Farmers Alliance. I'm really excited about these three because they're all very different, but have the same goal. So uh, while we wait for our other two panelists, Tim and I will get right into it. And, uh, you know, Tim, almost everyone here has a pretty, you know, basic understanding of the soil food web. We all had a little bit of an explanation of it. In our uh, in our studies for ganja, and then many people are also utilizing it in their in their day to day lives. But why why does that matter? Like why not just feed my plants on a schedule and buy my nutrients right from a from a science point of view, right? From a chemist point of view, a mineral is a mineral or an element is an element. You're muted. You're muted, Tim. Well, oh, there we go. Hi guys. Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, plants can uptake nutrition that way. I mean, it's been proven. It's how most of agriculture, unfortunately, operates. Um, but I think there is still, like in a lot of broad agriculture, uh, a microbial component that a lot of people don't recognize, even in a lot of soils. Um, and uh, through chemical agriculture, we've degraded a lot of that. Um, but the ideal way a plant wants to eat is through the metabolites of microorganisms. Uh, they really, the whole system, the best way it works is plants take in light from the sun. Uh, they photosynthesize, they create uh, sugars and all sort of photosynthes photosynthates, uh, which then uh, in an ideal situation, the plant puts between 20 and 40% back in the soil. Uh, and that feeds a whole diverse system of microorganisms and feed certain amino acids or enzymes or whatever it needs to feed certain microbial colonies to then feed on the nutrient that need. It will foster that whole system. Um, and even bigger, they realize there's a whole energy exchange system that happens in fungal food web out in, in nature. Um, you know, the idea of a mother tree, um, you know, there's same organisms that feed small organisms. They've always wondered how Plants, uh, you know, small plants under the can thick canopies of forests can survive and grow into giant trees. And they realize because they're receiving a lot of their nutrients through a microbial pathway system from more mature plants. You know, it's it, an exchange. These these things that they're they're able to feed on this would never be available through like a sterile environment, like a bottle-fed hydro system. No, I mean there's 
specific strains of microorganisms that have been shown to operate inside of chemically run systems to show improvements. Um, but really, it's a really complex, complex system when you really get into it. You know, uh, it's really basic in certain aspects. You know, um, it, it will operate with some microbes and it will be better than operating with no microbes. But once you start getting the full array of everything operating properly um, and that really that exchange of, um, you know, the plant sending energy into the soil and the soil providing the energy back from the plants in the form of nutrients and anything else the plant uh, in their ideal forms. Um, so like if you look at a nitrogen, for example, um, there's nitrate, there's nitrite, there's ammonia, um, and then you start getting into urea and amino acids and stuff like that. So when plants take up raw forms of nitrogen, um, it actually takes a lot more energy for the plant to convert that nitrogen into ultimately an amino acid and a peptide and complete protein, which ultimately, that's the whole point of photosynthesis is to create proteins. Um, so if you put nitrate into the system, it's been proven that if you use nitrate, uh, the plant uses, um, what, for every one part of nitrogen you put in, it uses 10 parts of sugar. That's 10 more units of energy it's using to convert that nitrate into something that the plant will actually want. Where if you focus on a diverse soil food web, where the plant is now um, allowing, so um, allowing the plant to uptake different forms of nitrogen, um, specifically amino acids and peptides, and sometimes proteins, um, that allows a plant to utilize that energy for other metabolic, metabolic function. So you get a more diverse terpene profile or more complexity out of the kind of, um, you know, and, and nitrogen is one of those things too, where, uh, what is it? It's estimated that there's a couple million pounds of nitrogen over every acre of soil. You know, the air we breathe is 80% nitrogen. Um, and uh, we microbes have figured out how to sequester that nitrogen from the atmosphere and allow plants to uptake it through, you know, a, a nitrogen cycle. Interesting. So I, I kind of want to go two pathways here. I want to talk about both starting from scratch, but I also want to get into, you know, if you already have a system up and running, but I think the best thing to do since you have a published recipe is to kind of start from that point of, of what your baseline is for building soil. Tim, I know that your, your uh, recipe is published on the website and everyone on organiccultivators.net. Yeah. We're going to get the updated one there shortly yeah. and everyone can kind of reference it there. But would you mind walking us through kind of the basis of your recipe? But from my point of view and something very interesting is can you talk about how you look for your, your materials and based on your geography and your location, how that really goes into your methodology and the sourcing of material? Uh, yeah, totally. So I run a, I like designed it off a pretty basic Cornell mix, which is 50% uh, uh, peat moss, 50% aeration. Um, I use perlite because it's local, it's cheap. It comes from around here, you know, to import pumice or some other volcanic rock. It's just cost and energy. It's just not really, I don't find any reason in doing it. Um, rice holes, people use them. There's issues with them. Uh, a lot of times, uh, Rice is an accumulator of arsenic, uh, so you can introduce a whole bunch of arsenic and you don't necessarily want. Um, so, you know, using things that are regionally local to you or ideal. Uh, then I do 20% compost. Um, find the best local compost you can. Uh, worm castings are ideal. Uh, just make sure you get at least a mineral analysis. Uh, compost uh, can traditionally be very high in sodium. Uh, that can cause a lot of issues. Uh, here, uh, Coast of Maine, actually, the lobster compost, the one I use, I don't use it heavily, uh, but it has a pretty high sodium load. So if you're constantly using that in an enclosed system, that sodium is going to build up and start causing issues down the road. Um, so then uh, I run a heavy calcium mix. Uh, I follow a lot of agronomists who focus on uh, a lot of calcium in the system. Uh, so um, I try to focus... So I have my old recipe that's 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 written on the on the website. Uh, I've been using that for I don't know six or seven, eight years or something like that. Um, I got heavy metal tests and I've always tested super low. I've never actually tested you know above the the threshold, uh, but there are potential inputs there that could carry heavy metal loads. So I've kind of amended that a little bit. 
Um, but pretty much like uh, it's you know soft rock phosphate. I use a wall of stonite, which is uh, calcium silicate. Um, uh, um, then uh, some zeolite, which is a special type of clay, uh, which an amorphous clay has a 3D structure that actually absorbs uh, ammonia and uh, uh, potassium. Uh, so it's a good sink for those. Um, and uh, those are those aren't sourced locally, but I feel like they're really great inputs. Um, something that's individual about my mix that's compared to a lot of other mixes is I don't use any carbonates. I don't use any uh, lime, uh, calcium carbonate specifically, or magnesium carbonate or anything like that. Why not? Uh, uh, well, um, so traditionally that's used to adjust pH, um, which pH is just the amount of uh, space available kind of in the soil for nutrition. Uh, so you can also adjust pH for calcium. Uh, and also through silica. Uh, so ideally, I'd want more silica in my system than carbonate. Uh, carbonates in soils and in water are a major issue. Um, specifically for like foliar sprays, if you have carbonates in your water, you need to have it under 50 parts per million of carbonates or has all sorts of, it binds with everything, it oxidizes minerals, just has a lot of ramifications. Um, so I like to stay away from it. Uh, so I've built my soil completely with no carbonates. You know, there's some in shrimp meal and there's some in fishbone meal, but but not a lot. Um, so um, yeah, there. So that actually is uh, that's a new mix. Um, that's actually a, a mix that I made. Uh, I worked with uh, Luna Whitcomb on. Um, she's actually running that soil right now. Um, I've moved around to uh, mending and doing all my new mixes, but I haven't. Uh, completely run that soil fresh yet. I haven't had a need to. Uh, so but she knows this, this soil mix is going to be on the organic cultivators website. Yeah. Shortly, like within the next couple weeks. So you don't like feel it. I can also send it to you if anyone's really curious. Yeah. So I dumped, uh, I took out, um, I took out the uh, rock dust. Uh, oh, excuse me. Not the rock dust. The um, uh, rock phosphate, that's the one I took out. I took out rock phosphate because that tends to have an issue with um, heavy metals. Um, and also phosphorus is a depleting source. We're going to run out of it in 40 years. So I'm trying to move away from sources that are not just naturally cycling in nature, like fishbone meal and shrimp meal and crustacean meal. Uh, those all naturally cycle in nature. So, you know, it's a waste byproduct of the, the fishing industry. Um, I don't particularly like to use any uh, byproducts of uh, uh, industrial agriculture, uh, you know, any any blood meals, bone meals, feather meals, stuff like that. They just, too many heavy metal issues, ethical issues, you know, they're just not really necessary. There's a lot of fish products out there that are, you know, the fishing industry has whole ethical issues, but um, it's a waste, it's there, you might as well use it, you know. Um, but yeah, that's um, that's the, the base mix. Um, I use a lot of granite, a lot of basalt, a lot of uh, biochar, uh, some biochar. Uh, some dry humates just to kind of initially create an ideal environment to boost microbial growth. Uh, and, and that's kind of the base mix for, for like the mineral aspect of it. Um, Cause I feel like combining the mineral and microbes is where the real magic happens. Um, there's people who are just mineral people and there's people who are just like Eileen Ingram, soil food web, microbes do everything. It seems to be in the middle. Um, you know, microbes are not going to create minerals out of nothing. Uh, if your soil is lacking in boron, you need to have that boron or it's not going to be there. And boron is a highly important mineral for, um, for a lot of different processes in the plant, but uh, it's typically deficient in most soils because it just leaches readily. Um, so uh, as far as bringing in microbes, um, uh, the compost brings in some, uh, compost brings in a uh, great diversity, but I like to bring in a lot of like leaf litter from outside, uh, a lot of different mulches. Just... And let's pump the brakes for one second. Oh, sorry. I just keep going. <laughs> Stop me. Thanks. I want to, I want to pose a question to you that, you know, you're kind of getting into the answer, which is interesting. So, you know, I build this soil recipe. It's working well for me. My plants are happy. And there's this concept of living soil and there's, you know, everything's feeding everything. Am I on autopilot here? Like how much work really goes into maintenance once your soil recipe is, is fixed, like is, is dialed in? I'm not talking about like the first, you know, maybe two grows, but once you're really happy with your soil, how much is really 
Uh, I mean, very simple. <laughs> uh, like currently, uh, I, I, uh, I harvest a plant. I just chop the chop the plant down. Uh, I cut around the root ball with a hori hori, just to the size of the pot the, that I'm going to transplant into. I sprinkle a little bit of amendments on the bottom. I put it in. I put my uh, just just find it in and just put a nice mulch. Uh, my amendment amendment layer mixed with compost and then a mulch on top. And I don't do anything else to the soil for the rest of the cycle. Um, you know, um, depending on size pots, uh, your full system um, amending less more often sometimes is better depending on the size pots. I feel like that's less important once you get that system completely rolling. Um, but uh, you wanna, it's a little work getting it going. Like you wanna make sure you bring in diversity. You wanna make sure you have some worms there. You wanna make sure that you visibly see microbial life, you know, uh, springtails and other rove beetles and stuff kind of running around before you can just kind of put it on autopilot. Yeah. So is that what you mean by you bring in leaf litter and other stuff? Is that getting this kick started? That will get all that stuff in there. Yep. There is a rich microbial diversity on leaves. I was actually reading two studies that they just did on leaves. They just did DNA sequencing on all the microbes on leaves and the fungal and bacteria. And they find that a leaf halfway decomposes on the tree before it even hits the ground. And it goes this whole diversity of this wide range of microbial species that pretty much encapsulates a lot of the things that we can want inside of our soil. And, you know, uh, really for me, um, you know, it's great to use some powder inoculants to maybe get some of these specific species in there, uh, trichoderma, uh, stuff like that. But um, as far as like vast diversity, uh, I just like bringing in leaf mulch and going around and collecting like a little handful of stuff from here and there. And all you really need to do is throw in a five gallon bucket, mix it around, and put it in there and whatever's going to stick is going to stick and whatever doesn't doesn't and from a lot of studies that i've been reading is uh, it's all these micro micro co microbe colonies throughout the world and they're all different species but they're all the same functional colonies and they all have functional properties so if you go to a bunch of different places you're going to get all these different diversity of microbes and some of them are going to live and some of them aren't and it's all based on mineral makeup uh, how many plant exudates you have in there, which how many growing root tips you have in the soil is going to feed it, or how much mulch you have on there. Um, you know, you always want to make sure that you have a carbon source for the microbes. That's like the number one thing. That's that's pretty much what you're doing. Hey, James. What's up, buddy? Hi. How you doing? Oh well. Killing it right now. I'm loving Thanks, everything you're saying. And uh, I love that uh, you keep going on this deep dive that's brought you around uh, to, um, you know, uh, the, microbes. the complete diversity of things. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Lovely. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's pretty much a system. And that's uh, pretty much how I think about it. And, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of other things you can do and you know yeah. run indoor cover crops and and not but that's all we're, we're gonna get to that don't you worry oh no yeah that's all just dependent james you know one of the things that i love about organic cultivators and one of the things that really uh introduced me to you i i actually met james um before wendy because i was interested in organic cultivators uh is that you don't preach any one system right a system is, is for the person. So with anything, there's all these, you know, various multiple methodologies. If someone's either, you know, looking to do this from the start or looking to transition into this and they go on your website, they're looking at all these soil recipes, they're looking at these methodologies, they're on the Facebook group. Where do they start? Or is that really regional or person-based? Well, so are you talking about somebody who's like a complete novice to growing or someone who's trying to get into more of a soil approach from something else? Because those are two kind of completely different answers. <clears throat> Start with someone that's transitioning and then we can also talk about a novice. Um, yeah, I would say um, probably a good place to start is read Jeff Lowenfeld's books. Um, he's got a great series that kind of distills, um, you know, lots of studies and information, um, all in one area. 
um, and that's a good place to get a pretty good foundation. Um, and then once you um, read those books, I would also read um, Inside Plants, um, which is, uh, it goes on kind of a deeper dive into the inner workings of plants than Jeff's books do. Um, I haven't read Jeff's new book, but um, I know it's, you know, it deals with the rhizophagy and everything. Um, the soil recipes on the website, oh, there it is. Um, the soil recipes on uh, the website uh, probably need to be updated. Those are just some random recipes from people. Um, I would say, you know, to start out going in living soil, um, definitely get into the biggest volume of bed uh, that you can. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Tim was, is definitely more of a uh, mad scientist when it comes to building soil than, than I am. Um, but I, you know, if you can't build your own soil, get the best bag soil you can and, and you can build it and grow it into something that is a good living soil. And, uh, outside of that, you know, like a basic coots mix is, you know, a decent spot for most people to start and, uh, and kind of grow from there. Um, otherwise, yeah, there's a whole drop down menu in the website that's got a bunch of learning resources, you know, pick one and go they're kind of listed in order there's a reading list read as much as you can on there. Um, I still have to read some of the stuff on there but it's all it's all great stuff. Oh, you're muted bud. Uh, Kush coach you got a question. Um, well, I just kind of wanted to like add on to some of that because I deal with a lot of beginning growers and a lot of them ask about this like how do we go into like how do we transition from this mainstream way of thinking especially in like uh, a lot of home grows you know people are instantly introduced to the bottles and one thing I start off with is always identify what what your environment are you growing indoors are you growing outdoors how much space do you have to work with and start to narrow down because like James was saying, there's so many different kind of methodologies when it comes to how we approach organic cultivation. And I think kind of looking at your situation and there was a grower that I followed on Instagram for a while that kind of had this little saying that was situation is boss. So, you know, when you kind of look at what you have available to you and what space you have and how you're kind of looking at getting started to grow, it helps beginning growers narrow down what, you know, methodology they want to try and tackle initially. And that always, for me, that started with, you know, have starting with an understanding of cannabis and then having an understanding of just how soil works. That was one of the things that I really loved about the organic cultivators group is because there were so many methodologies offered it really gave me this like overview of, oh, look at all these similarities that these have in common. This must be a very, you know, important piece of, you know, soil biology and, and cultivating something, you know, on an organic, you know, methodology. I, I think there's kind of something to say about, you know, step back and look at what you're about to deal with and then kind of narrow down what is going to work best for you because you know like um we can talk about you know biology collection and some people have this incredible opportunity to go out and set traps for you know collecting imo where some people don't necessarily have that ability so collecting small amounts and mixing it in that bucket and going that approach like you're, you're almost getting the same end result. It's just a matter of like, which one's going to suit you best. And that's, that's something that's always kind of served me when I'm talking to be people beginning or even looking into transitioning, um, just kind of taking that like step back for a second and look at the whole big picture and then focus in and on, on, on a portion that's going to kind of suit you. That, I want to add on to that real quick. If I can, Noah, James, go for it, man. Um, Probably the best advice that I could add to that is really keeping it simple, um, certainly in the beginning, um, keeping things really simple. Um, also being aware of um, some of the pitfalls of what you could be entering in and doing. Um, 
I know Tim was talking about bringing leaf litter into your grow. That's amazing. Um, it's a great way to bring microbes and fungi in. It's also a good way to bring pill bugs into your indoor. Um, so unless you're um, ready to kind of deal with that and know that that's something that you may have to address, um, you know, you could you could find yourself in a situation down the road where you're like, oh, shit, I didn't know that that was going to happen. Um, so really kind of keeping it simple and building that foundation. Um, definitely, you know, any microbes are better than none. Um, the, the more you can get away from buying micro, you know, bugs in a jug better. Um, but just uh, be aware that there there may be some, you know, go through and pick out any roly polies if you can. I'll agree with that. <laughs> Kill all pill bugs. That's the only one to go. Hi, Wendy. Everything else stays. Wendy, we don't. Hi, everybody. Wendy, you <laughs> Hi, Wendy. Killing things. We'll we'll go put them somewhere else. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so the the thing that I'll say about the roly polies is mm. I dealt with them um, the same time that Joshua Steensland was dealing with them, and both of us were experiencing the same thing at the same time. Um, he was a little bit like maybe a couple weeks before of me with his infestation levels. I had a greenhouse. He had an indoor. They were flooding literally under the basement door, the garage door into his house. For me, they were just everywhere. It was gnarly. And everything that you found online was like, oh, these are beneficial bug. Don't worry. They only eat dead material. And I was, both of us were like, no, that is not the case at all. What I will say about them is that things like isopods and the larger arthropods do have the ability to mitigate heavy metals in your soil and in your plant material. So there is some, you know, I kind of just believe in all things in balance and all things in moderation. I don't think that pill bugs are the worst case scenario, but every single living soil, really well built, large scale, and even small scale, but larger scale, like beds, not pots. Um, grow has had issues with them. They do, I, I don't think you can even pick them out. I think you just need to be prepared. If you're gonna go into one of these systems, you be prepared to mitigate these bugs because they will have a population explosion because you have such a robust system that they're, and they don't have any predators in there. Yeah. So, you know, I've seen people really, really well mitigate, supposedly, I haven't been in their grows, so I don't know for sure, but people are literally bringing toads in and the toads are eating the roly polies. So if you have a small enough system and you can import some toads, you know, then know that, you know, with your roly polies, you might need to bring in some predators on them. Um, yeah. And the other thing you can do that I have not yet been able to trial out successfully myself, I have helped some clients that didn't um, quite take things through to fruition, which would be the integrated pest management I IMO. Um, I know that Steve Reisner has done some work on this. Originally, this came from Chris Trump. And uh, basically, you're incorporating the carcasses of some larger arthropod or like a cricket or, you know, like literally you could go and buy dead crickets from the store or the um, mealy bugs, that mealy worms that just feed the chickens uh, and incorporate that as part of your rice and your collection box with the theory that you could be collecting a fungi that will eat the chitin, which is the outside shell of these bugs. If you do that successfully, you could make a tea with it and you could be spraying those um, fungal spores on the pests, the, the larger pests that are being problematic and you could therefore mitigate them. This is all stuff that, you know, Chris says, no, not necessarily insect frass. It, to my understanding, insect frass is actually the um, the feces of the larger bugs, like black soldier fly larvae, everybody's nodding, so okay, um, as opposed to earthworm castings, which tend to be bacterially dominant, uh, both are great, uh, but not, not the same function at all. What we're trying to do is actually get fungi that will attack the outer layer of these pests and therefore kill them off as well as the eggs. So chitinase <laughs> and gelatinase are the two enzymes that will um, eat through the eggs and the shells of, I'm using shells as a, you know, the exoskeleton of larger pests or larger oh. bugs that become problematic. <laughs> right. And the one thing you, the, uh, the one discussion that we've always had around that is that, that if it works in that function is that that is an indiscriminate killer. 
So you wouldn't want to spray that necessarily outside. Yeah. You could affect bee populations. That'd be something you want to use very carefully. Um, but in an indoor, you know, nuke the shit out of it. Indoor yeah. or greenhouse, it would be something. But um, but also the other the other thing to keep in mind is that if you're using any type of uh, predator insects that you're buying, then you're probably killing them off too. So it is something to be used kind of as a, a, you know, in levels of infestation that are becoming really seriously problematic and you don't have a lot of other ways to mitigate. Personally, I'll go, I'll go try and catch some toads. I think that that's a really cool way of doing it. But, um, you know, if you're running a, you know, 100,000 square foot facility with, you know, 50 lights, you're probably, that's, that's maybe not going <laughs> to be such a, a great trap. I saw someone comment about cordyceps down there. We should ask Suzanne about that, but I would, I think cordyceps is mostly, you know, larger bugs and stuff like that. So I don't know that, you know, uh, I'm not sure, but I don't think there's a cordyceps that can get your spider mites for you. I love IPM conversations, and I think we should definitely try to get Suzanne to talk more about this with us, but taking a step to something that's happening here on the East Coast, Wendy, that I think you have a lot of experience in, is people right now with what's going on in the tri-state area are buying farms upstate or in Massachusetts or other areas that either have never been agriculturally farmed or have been agriculturally farmed with big ag, right? They're either wheat fields or, or corn fields, you know, mostly sprayed with, with vast chemicals. Okay, so I have this farm I buy. I don't really know much about the soil. What do I do now? How do I get that ready? Well, where do I even start? You start with soil tests first, um, oh. definitively. You wanna test it for pesticides. So this is not gonna be a traditional soil test. We're, we're not necessarily looking at this point to see what type of nutrients are available, what the soil texture is, what the organic material content is. Right now, we just wanna know, are there pesticides and herbicides that have been laced in that? Um, herbicides are another one. Like what is your broadleaf herbicide killer content that's in that soil? Because depending on what your crop is or was, you know, that can become seriously problem problematic as well. Um, there's a lot of conventional farms that are being sold and not being fully disclosed as to what was sprayed on there. There's a lot of conventional farms that use herbicide ready seed. Um, so they can cover everything with herbicide and have a corn or wheat uh, that is not susceptible to those herbicides those get left in the ground, you know, you can really run into trouble. So um, I don't know offhand of the um, testing labs. I know two or three of them. I just can't recall any of their names, but finding a, an agricultural testing lab that tests soil specifically for pesticides and herbicides is, is your primary concern. I'd say you wanna do that before you even buy it, just so you know what you're getting into. If you do have high levels of pesticides and herbicides, you're gonna need to do something to mitigate it. So, you know, there is um, Cornell, great, great, great university. Cornell's amazing. Yeah, also um, in local and really these tests, I was saying locally. Yeah, really, you can check your ag extension. If you want like an ongoing relationship, Rutgers University here will also work with you and you get like weekly tests. Beautiful. Yeah, and these tests shouldn't be costing you hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So you don't want to go in saying, I'm going to be a hemp or cannabis farmer. Um, hemp, maybe not so much anymore, but I know if you say cannabis, they're going to charge you 10 times what they should be charging you, if not more. Um, so you just want to say like, oh, I'm looking to buy a farm, uh, you know, growing corn and wheat. I want to see what's going on. I want to be an organic farm. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that on this particular piece of property. Um, so yeah, your local ag extension can usually also help you with that um, if you're not on the East Coast or West Coast necessarily. Um, or your ag, your department of ag can also give you some usually some, you know, good lines to, to shoot down to try and figure that out. So let's, um, let's, once you know what's going on, mm -hmm. right, let's, let's Sorry, go ahead, Noah. that we bought a good piece of property and, and there's no serious pesticide or herbicide or even heavy metal issues, but it's not necessarily an active good soil, right? Where we have a pretty, we have dirt at the end of the day here, right? We have a kind of a mess, right? Like much like my yard currently. Um, 
what do we do? Like, where, where do we start? Right. We, we want to be in the soil. We want to do it. So we just start tilling. Like, you know, we thought once to you do. might, you might need to, it kind of depends your, your next step. Once you know, whether you're dealing with any, any pesticides or herbicides is to actually get a, my opinion of this anyway, what makes the most sense to me. Um, and what I've learned and, um, taken some courses on conventional farming, organic conventional farming. So this isn't even cannabis specific. It's just growing shit in the ground, right? So your next step is figuring out your texture. Are you heavy clay? Are you sand? Are you sandy, silty, loamy? You know, kind of where those balances are because you want to address that first. So if you're out and you're like, oh, we have super heavy clay soil. There's not a lot of organic material. We're at like, you know, 2% organic material or maybe even less. Um, it turns into dust in the summertime. It turns into a you know concrete block when it starts to dry out. It turns into a soupy, mucky mess in the winter. You, you have to address that next uh, because it doesn't matter how many nutrients you put on that soil. If it can't absorb it and hold it, you're, you're in a world of just chasing your tail consistently. So a lot of times with heavy clay soil, heavy clay is easier to mitigate than heavy sand. If you have a lot of sand, it means it's very porous, right? So you think about sand at the beach, water drains through it really quickly for the most part, okay? That means that you need to add stuff to hold on to water and nutrients, otherwise everything is just leaching straight down into your bedrock and it's gone. So your plants can't even access, access it because it's just gone too fast. Um, if you've got heavy clay, you know, you add a lot of organic material, you can add some sand and you can get a nice deep six to eight inch layer fairly quickly. And I am talking in the scope of, you know, broader terms. I'm not talking about a day or two, like your organic matter is going to settle. You're going to have some time, but you'll be able to get a good crop in pretty quickly. If you've got heavy sand. Again, you're, I actually have not worked with anybody specifically. I've given kind of pointers and then never heard back. Uh, but I know that heavy sand is more difficult. You might need to go into raised beds. You might need to do something to figure out how to make sure your organic material isn't disappearing on you and your clay. You need the clay in there too. I know I was listening to Tim earlier and he was talking about minerals and like that's where a lot of our minerals are coming from is this broken down rock material, right? So if that's not there, you're, you're back right around to what he was talking about where you don't have it there for your microbials, your microbes to access. You have to have everything in balance. Okay. You know, one of the things that we were talking about Tim with also is once you kind of have this system up and running, you know, is the maintenance. Um, you not only are a firm believer in KNF, but you went so far as to teach it, right? So that, that's a pretty big dedication. What is it about KNF specifically that, that you think is different than maybe other methodologies or maybe more suited for you that, that brought you there? Like, why, why is that the road you took? So Korean natural farming becomes really important for farms that are, um, heavily restricted and looked at. Cannabis is very specific. Hemp is also gonna be there if it, and when it gets regulated, right? We can't have heavy metals. Our parts per billion of pesticides and herbicides is so freaking low that I know people that have lost entire crops because they failed testing because somebody had a dog that they used ivermectin on. And that ivermectin, as the dog walked through the field or as the person petted the dog got transferred to the plant. So it is, our testing is so sensitive that you can have a massive crop loss due to these little tiny things that you wouldn't even think about necessarily. So when we're talking about specifically, you know, when we're talking about food, even food and medicine in general, my belief is that, you know, the cleaner, the better, obviously. Um, the things that we don't test for that they allow us to eat is just, <laughs> absolutely insane. Our water, our lead, the lead drinking levels, look at what it was historically, look at where it is now. Every time the lead gets too high, they raise it. And they're like, oh, now this is acceptable levels, right? So for me, there's a lot of um, immoral and unethical stuff that goes on at the FDA level. And, um, and when then when you start talking about cannabis and you start talking about food production and you start looking into like, I want to be organic. Okay. What does that mean? That means I need to go source organic cow manure because I don't have cows. So I need to add nitrogen to my field. I need to figure out how to get all those minerals in there. I need to get some oyster shell. I need to get um, some alfalfa meal, but oh gosh, I can't get on alfalfa meal because it's not organic or even the organic stuff they use weird stuff on. So it becomes this level of like, ah, how do I make sure that what I'm growing is safe and is going to pass testing? 
Well, the only way I know how to do that is to make sure it's all under my control. I don't, don't bring outside stuff in as much as possible. I bring in as little as I can. I close that loop so tight that you know you really can't get through it. And then I don't have to worry about all this testing. I don't worry about heavy metals. I don't worry about pesticides. I don't worry about herbicides. I don't worry about anything that might make me lose an entire run other than a bad distributor and non-paying retailers. <laughs> well, um, that's a but basically, yeah, Korean natural farming. Now, I was yeah. say distributors. Whole other conversation. You and I will continue that conversation as we, we talk about, but yeah, that's a whole other fun game. Tim, you are not a KNF guy. Can you? I don't. E I don't even know what I would call you. I mean, um, you grew great herb. We we call him a soil guru. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Can you talk a little bit um, about how you got to your methodology, what you would say your methodology is, and why you know why that works for you to kind of flavor of two. Wendy, all right. Nope, oh. just trying to hit mute so that I don't make. <laughs> Try to give um, people. I want to try to give people a flavor, right, of chocolate and vanilla here, right? Two very different ways of going about the same outcome. Yeah. So uh, I was really fortunate. The first uh, hydro shop I worked at in New York, uh, my boss was super progressive, and he had Acres USA magazine always distributed. He had Elaine Ingram's first, like it was just it was ring bound, and it was just a bunch of photocopies of email papers uh, of uh, emails uh, back and forth to to students and stuff, and um, from bread from stones and all these like great agriculture books, and that got me into it. And I read a biodynamic farm by Hugh Lovell, and I started diving into biodynamics real heavy, um, and trying to uh, understand whoop, closer, uh, trying to understand biodynamics and. Um, you know, I did that for a little while, but I realized uh, stirring a pot of compost in your living room and then go bring it indoors to water plants, it's really just kind of, it's not biodynamic. <laughs> it was cool. It was great. But, uh, but that just led me on the whole path of like learning how to build microbial systems. And um, KNF didn't come around until, you know, 10 or 10 plus years after I was already studying a lot of this stuff. And, and I see a lot of great value in KNF. Um, it's great for bringing in different culture, you know, um, it brings in a lot of different things. It's a way to, a methodology to think about using what's around you. Um, and that's really like a great way of looking at things. Um, I try to do that as much as possible as well. Um, I try to get, bring as much leaf mulch. There's like, there's a vast difference of, of cultivating indoors versus like uh, this methodology versus outdoors. And you know, the, some of the methods I use indoors be kind of different than some of the methodology I use outdoors. Um, through my course of learning, it seems that like, what's the same in all these systems is um, build it and they'll come. You know, you build these environments that are beneficial for microbial systems, uh, use of mulches, use of diverse cover crops outside, um, all the root exudates, all those sugars, all those everything just feeds all these microorganisms that are already present in most soils. You know, like I believe that most of these microorganisms are already indigenous in our soils and it's about bringing, it's about stimulating them to wake them up. Oh, <laughs> oh what's that field guide two? Is that one and two? Here, is that one and two? That is it. That's actually it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's what I said. Well, there you go. That's it. I, um, oh, I don't know how to use this thing when that yeah. stupid background oh, is on. That, that, so, that's yeah. actually, that's it. She charged like $90 for that thing back in the day. It was crazy. Um, uh, I bought so, the whole set. I had a whole set of her books for uh, <laughs> when I took a bridging the gap class with her. So <laughs> <laughs> totally, that's awesome. Yeah. But, you know, just, you know, I, I read a bunch of Elaine stuff and, you know, reading a bunch of biodynamic things and, and getting Acres USA magazine and, and reading through that. And, you know, uh, it, it really seems that the people who are the deepest into the microbial, microbial research realize that most of these things are there. And the best way to build these systems is to have multiple diverse roots intermingling all at once, at least four different families. So, you know, a uh, brassica, um, you know, a grass, um, um, uh, a legume and a cannabis plant, four different types of root plants. And that is from most of the research, they realized that's the best way to build a microbial system. So um, carbon is the key, sugar is the key. So having a mulch, having these different things like that, to me, 
through all my learning through the years is, is the key to making this all work. And, you know, introducing the minerals that stimulate certain microbial colonies is also a key component that's maybe missed in certain methodologies. Um, for instance, molybdenum. Molybdenum is commonly deficient in many soils. Molybdenum is the base center um, uh, atom for uh, the nitrogenase enzyme. So if you don't have the nitrogenase enzyme, you don't, uh, microbes don't have the availability to sequester nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Plants, if they don't have enough molybdenum, they don't have the proper nitrogenase to create proper proteins inside of a plant and degrade nitrates are sent into plants. So the difference between a lot of like chem forest agriculture stuff, the reason why you don't get the complexity and the diversity is like the plant just doesn't have the minerals and the proper forms like these, these complex structures inside the plant that a that a plant that's allowed to feed itself through microbial action can do. You know, there's a, there's a lot more energy inside of a plant that um, is what you need. I know this is kind of a ramble on flow. Oh, it's wonderful. James, you know, coming from a more indoor background and now getting to see the, the full life cycle of an outdoor grow, what would you say are some of your biggest takeaways of really the ability to recreate outdoors indoors? I mean, it's never perfect, but you know, in some states we got to do what we got to do. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I mean, I've been growing <clears throat> vegetables for like 25 years. So I've been, I'll, basically since I've been 10, I've been putting plants in the ground and growing food. Um, there's only uh, relatively recently, uh, you know, in the last, you know, four or five years that I was building soil inside and trying to mimic outdoors because I had grown hydroponically when I was younger and had a lot of fun with it, but I, you know, I was young, so I didn't know I was being dumb. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the difference between, you know, an indoor grow and an outdoor grow is, you know, an outdoor grow, like Tim said, I mean, if you have, you know, like if you farm the way we farm, it is very much polycropping. Uh, we just let, you know, multiple species and families of plants grow together. Um, and that does really provide a healthy system. I mean, we even had a couple of um, caterpillars you know, this year because of the brassicas out there, but because the farm itself overall so healthy, you know, things are just picking them off. So it doesn't end up being a huge problem. As far as mimicking, you know, you know, outside indoors, I think the best thing you can do is try to get um, multiple different uh, sources of microbial inoculants. Um, you know, I know uh, we have a lot of discussion kind of in the OC chat about uh, KNF and, and its implications. And there has been a lot of discussion, just like there has been, you know, there's the soil food web group and biodynamic and KNF people. Um, I think Korean natural farming is a great toolbox uh, or a tool for your toolbox. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're being a smart farmer, uh, you recognize that, you know, there's a lot of inputs you can make for yourself. Uh, that you don't have to go out and buy, uh, and you can make them for relatively cheap. Um, and the, you know, there really is a path forward in doing that. Um, you're never going to be able to mimic outside. I think the the biggest limiting factors are, you know, sun. Um, you know, right now there are a few lights that really get close to the sun, and uh, unfortunately, they're just not really on a lot of people's radars. Um, there's a company called Sun on Demand that uh, makes, uh, I, people call them plasma lights. It's a H-E-S-P-L, I think it is. Um, but uh, except for their they're like the closest grand. you're going to get to the sun. What's it's, that? James, except for their six grand a piece and nobody's really seen one. Well, that's the problem. They're really expensive. So um, they're expensive. And then according to um, Michael Wolf Siegel, um, because they emit a radio frequency, if you get too much of them in a grow, so if you have like a commercial operation, um, you become in violation of SEC uh, rules and guidelines uh, because you, you become an interference um, in uh, other radio signals. So um, there is some limiting factors there. Like if you want to have a huge commercial grow with uh, the plasma lights, you're going to have to build a giant Faraday cage 
around everything just to block the radio. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think you can get pretty close indoors. And like I said, there's some limiting factors, but people are doing some really cool stuff with mixed light between LEDs um, and HPS. And then with the addition of UV and infrared, I mean, there's some really cool stuff going on. Um, people are mimicking sunrise and sunset. Um, if you're in beds indoors and you're fostering that microbial community and making sure you have the minerals in there, like it really is a function of having all of that together. Um, and if you have a system set up, as far as maintenance, like at least on the microbial side, once you set your system up and it's up and running, you shouldn't have to be doing things to it other than watering it and the, you know, down the line, if you need to add some things, that's, you know, as far as amendments, that's different. Um, but your microbes should find a balance and you should be fostering them so that they're surviving. Um, and the best way to do that is by getting a lot of different sources of microbes, leaf litter, IMO, if you feel like doing that, um, you know, go out, get some spent mushroom blocks like you can do a lot of different things to kind of tinker around and, and make that happen and then over time your system should find balance and you can foster that with cover crops and companion planting and adding organic matter consistently so you're feeding them um, but you know you shouldn't have to be re-inoculating all the time so buying things like recharge and stuff like that it's better than nothing um, you know but really um, you should, getting away from that is, is the best way to be. Um, and I know there's been some research around um, the microbial inoculants really mostly dying off or already being dead so that when you're feeding them, they're just becoming food for the stuff that's already in your soil. And since they have some nutritional content, you are seeing a boost from it, but it, you aren't necessarily inoculating your soil with those microbes. So you know, what are you really doing? Um, and unless you have a microscope to kind of check and see what your soil's doing and maybe even looking at your inoculants under a microscope, you have no idea what you're putting on there. If I, if I could pop in there real quick. Uh, yeah, keep microbes alive, water. You do not need to be moist. Uh, living soil growers need to be moister than traditional growers. Otherwise the system just shuts down. Water is the number one limiting factor. Uh, and as far as inoculating too, is like, uh, so they just did a bunch of research and they found that one of the most common uh, phosphorus solubilizing uh, microbes that are in a lot of these uh, uh, products, these bags products, are actually found in cannabis leaves already. So, you know, these endophytes that are in plants are just like prolif prolific throughout the environment. So bringing in different sources of plant material, different seeds, different things, or you're constantly inoculating, it's probably not all going to stick, but you're constantly bringing stuff in and, and potentially something might. Interesting question from Greg. Can you yeah, make saw from the leaf litter to limit introducing pill bugs, et cetera? You can, but you're going to limit your diversity from the leaf litter. As soon as you put it in water and start aerating it, you're going to lose some microbes. Some microbes are not fit to survive in that way. So like a compost tea is great. It's never going to be as good as actual good compost. So, you know, there's the school of thought that, you know, you can just you know, make a big batch of compost tea and spray it out there and you have this great diverse community, um, better than nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's the best way you have to inoculate a large field, go for it. It's never gonna be as diverse as the actual source material because those microbes, they're not all, you know, uh, built to live in an aqueous solution being tumbled around like that. So, um, yeah, and it's... And, and I'll pop in and add in more on that even, which is that um, Tim actually turned us on to this great, great um, YouTube, I think it is, a uh, lady named Dr. Christine Jones. She's Christine from Australia, Jones. I believe. Yes. Yeah, phenomenal, interesting. Like it's, it's crazy the information they're finding now compared to, you know, even two or three years ago. And I believe it was in that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, because I listen to a lot of stuff lately and sometimes they get muddled, but I believe she was saying that there is less than 1% of the known species of fungi that are out there that we can actually propagate in a lab setting. It's, it's, so, it's, you know, I, this is under perfect. Mm -hmm. All microbes, I think. Yeah, I think, I, I don't think it's just specifically fungi. I think it it's all? like as a whole, just 1% of all microbes out there. It's only 1% of them are cultivatable. Um, you know, they need each other. So. So that's they need well, each other. well, not even that. Right, right. Yeah, they need each other. Um, so, you know, when you're even thinking about buying inoculants 
uh, Christine Jones, Dr. Christine Jones. She's just, she's got a four part series on YouTube um, that talks, one of them talks about the nitrogen cycle. One of them talks about phosphorus cycle. And if the other one, I forget what they're called. Uh, they're great. Cover crops. Um, Cover crops. Yep, yep, yep. Um, you, you can tell we all watch the same stuff. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it gets pretty deep. It gets a bit heady, but it's definitely worth checking out. And it's there's a lot of science going on right now that's kind of contradicting what we thought before and how we thought things worked. And it really, to me, just comes down to like we really don't know what we're what's going on in the soil at all. So for me, the more diverse you can get, the better off you are. And knowing that you know if you're limiting a plant a a, a a being's, an organism's ability to proliferate and propagate by taking them out of their natural system, you're going to have limited diversity. You know, you put us on land and we're doing great overpopulating. You put us all underwater, we're going to have a rough time even with scuba equipment. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, um, so it's just a, it's something to, to think about when you're doing these things. Is it a good step? It's, it's yes, absolutely. Any step towards these systems is a good step to take. I also wanted to add on the other reason why I do free and natural farming is because it's incredibly cost effective. I can do just about everything on my farm for pennies per square foot, as opposed to many, many dollars per square foot. I just did some of these math for them on how much they were spending on their commercial scale grow and it was like over five dollars per square foot on on inputs um, and this was a small farmer and it was um that's a whole another discussion we're gonna do a discussion james and i one of these days really soon tim will bring you and anybody else in who wants to join us i think michael seagal will farmer in the sky is going to join us on that one hopefully on uh, ethical sponsorship and what that means um, great 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 topic because, we talked about wendy okay. yeah Definitely, you're putting your name on the product. You're telling us. Uh, we have two questions as we wrap yep. up here, Mary and then Jeff. Hey guys, um, I was wondering if anyone has played around with or has thought about integrating these um, home home composters into their growing system. Um, there's this one from Lomi, and there's this one from Wrinkle. I got that the Wrinkle one from Indiegogo. And it's basically a you know a speed composter. So you add your food pros, food stuff waste to it, and, and yard waste too. I'm sure I've been putting in it. And then in a day or two, you have usable compost. And so the way I'm using it with my growing is to sort of okay, I need to feed these guys like you know in, in a couple of days or in a week. So I start thinking about what I'm putting in the composter to sort of get what I think I'm gonna need for the plant. So I'm wondering if anybody has really explored this approach to things yet, and if you guys have anything to say towards that. Uh, I, I've uh, looked into them a little bit. I don't really know how they function or operate exactly. Um, I think it's through heat, Tim. That's it, it's just a break, it chops it up and heats it, would, it? It would have to be. It's. I think you're just basically providing organic matter for whatever yeah. Is it in your soil? It's not necessarily a microbial rich compost at all. One of them, probably I, dead. Yeah, one of them I thought was kind of more like a Bokashi thing. I could have been interpreting it wrong, but like a, a small Bokashi where he heats it up and kind of, you know, breaks it down a little bit. I, yeah. I, I personally, I really don't know enough about it to really make a statement. Have about you? That, honestly. Have you used that wrinkle one very much? Because that's the one that I Googled since that's the one that you have. Have you, when it, yeah. after a day later, what is the material like? What's it look like? So, so they give you this um, starting material and you put it in there, you add water to it and it's heat and agitation. So there's these little hands that move around in a circle and it, it's constantly moving when you close the door. So it, it keeps it heated and, and, and agitated. Um, and so I, I'm not sure what, they don't, give you a lot of information about what their starter stuff is okay. um, and they say you need to keep it going for if you let it go longer than seven days then you got to start over so it's it's this ongoing thing um oh, i'm hmm. sorry what's the the question again it's so that that's basically just how it how it works um and then so you get this sort of um it's like a sandy i, I don't know it looks like almost like leaf mold but but with uh, peat moss mixed into it it's kind of a crazy looking stuff uh, but like yeah that, brand like a brand type thing kind of yeah yeah uh-huh that's a good description yeah and then sounds. you're adding your scraps to it i mean that kind of sounds like a bokashi, bokashi. But... yeah war a quick warm bokashi like a fast bokashi it's, it's more of a bokashi type style composter my I've, I've looked into them actually 
to to I've never ha I don't have one. I one haven't day used is really it. short. Though. Um, no, that's crazy. And the part of the reason why is I didn't really like that. Like I couldn't find information on what the mm -hmm. catalyst is. So that always brings into question to me what exactly is it that's in there? Is that a biological? And if so, am I adding that? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is it just something that is super super high nitrogen, so it's really hot, so it gets it cooking super fast? Um, I'm personally a proponent of vermicompost. I really like my worms. I really like that they're a natural system to um, get rid of any pathogens. Um, I'm also a lazy composter. So something that I have to like, you know, layer brown and green and all of this, like, I'm just like, meh, you know, I'm just gonna throw it out in a pile and let the worms do the work for me. Um, so they make great little vermicast um, systems for your home as well. So my opinion is that's something I can just add things to. And yes, it does take a longer process. So um, Carrie, I think was talking, I think that's who was talking, um, is talking about kind of a, a crop steering where you're thinking, okay, I'm going to be going into bloom. So I want to get some things that maybe have more phosphorus and maybe more potassium in them. So maybe I want to look to compost some cucumbers and some whatever, something else. Um, or I'm going to be going into veg. So I want to get a lot of green waste in there that's high nitrogen and it's a way to get compost quickly. Um, again, my, my only cautionary thing with that would be having a mind to what their catalyst is. And because it, even with heat and agitation, it's going to take more than, you know, two to seven days to normally get a full compost. So something's going on in there that I hesitant to uh back until i understood more about it look at well, it I'm, under a microscope would I, be my I suggestion just add real quick um i'm, I'm using it as part of a multi-pronged approach so i do have worms also mm -hmm. i do have a regular compost bin so there's i have all these different paths ways that i can use different stuff and i'm actually using that stuff adding it to the worm composting as well so it gets processed further down the road and then awesome. i can use that later so so i'm just trying to give myself as many options as possible with my growing, I, you know, so. I, I honestly, Carrie, I think you're probably doing more work than you need to. Um, if it's in the soil, the plant is going to use it when it needs it. So this is really a, a change and a shift in our perspective going from an NPK system where we literally have junky plants that we are force feeding and we're saying, we're going to feed you, you know, tons of potassium right now. And I'm going to feed you tons of nitrogen right now. And now I'm going to force feed you a bunch of minerals. And a lot of that's because we're in these inert soilless systems that don't hold things. So we have to keep going and we have to force feed our plants and our plants are literally hooked to an IV and they're just little junkies and they're hard to get off of that, right? But if you have soil that is real soil, it's got biology, it's active, it's got enough volume, which is about apparently about 60 gallons of soil is what you need to have a system that's kind of functional on its own. Um, and this is just through some testing that a guy named, guy named Scott did a while ago. I don't know if anybody's done anything on it recently, but I'm more volume is easier. Months. Yeah. Um, so more volume is an easier system to, to have be self-sustaining, right? So if you have all of that in the soil, and what the plant does is it says, oh, I, there's tons of nitrogen. I got all my phosphorus. I got all my potassium. I have all my micronutrients, my trace minerals. Everything's there. So now when I need it, I can get it instead of saying like, I'm going to force this on you now. So even when you're doing all of this composting, you're maybe kind of trying to crop steer with your compost, but I don't know that you really need to do that. I think that if you're doing this system and then you've got regular compost and you got your vermicompost, as long as you're, you know, replenishing that every cycle or maybe even twice a cycle if you want to top dress, um, I, I think that that is more than enough. I don't think that you need to go that extra step of having this little machine unless it's something you enjoy. If it's something you love doing and it brings you joy to see that turn into this, you know, grainy stuff in seven days, then, then I say, go for it. I don't think you're doing any harm. Um, you're just maybe doing more work than you need to. Yeah. Well, I definitely, uh, I've, I've internalized your least amount of work in the garden as, as, as it needs to make it healthy thing. And, and I, I'm definitely trying not to do that, you know, but it's, you know, when you have your food waste and you're processing it, most of this stuff is actually going to go into the rest of the garden, which is going to make the compost that's actually going to be a part of the cannabis situation. So, so this is all about building the system. Like I'm trying to do a, a, um, a regenerative garden in my Southern California backyard, basically, so that it all 
feeds into this healthy system. And this is just another facet of that. So I just thought, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Close uh, those loops. I love it. That's awesome. Great question. Uh, great, great answer. Jeff and then Taylor will get you. On that. Oh, cool. Okay. So real quick, Carrie, um, maybe in the future, instead of using their catalyst, seek out a KNF or JADAM method where you can create your own catalyst that you kind of know where that's coming from yeah. and then put that into your machine and see if that works, you know, better. And, and at least you know what is accelerating the decomposition inside that machine instead of just using something that they give you. Because as, as gardeners, especially within this group, we all have essentially come to the conclusion that that's essentially a Bakashi. So I think you could make your own labs and, cool. you know, you might be able to add your own composting agent in there and accelerate that. Um, but my, my, I kind of had two questions. Um, my first question was kind of going to like cleaning up leaf litter. Um, Wendy, do you think if you were to like gather up leaf litter, bring it home, put it in a box and do like your own IMO collection you know, using a rice trap on top of that, do you think just moving it out of its location, you would lose a lot of beneficial? Would there be any like use to doing that, cleaning it up like that? And then um, my second question, I guess is, is tough because I deal with like when I was setting up my greenhouse this year, where I'm at in a residential area, I had to get through about 18 inches of like construction fill dirt. So it's absolutely trash dirt. Um, it's almost something like I had to dig down and just get down to the clay before I could really start with working anything. Is there a way to approach remediating that or is it just kind of like, let's get it out? Yeah. Okay. So um, first off with the removal of leaf litter, if you have leaf litter that you're trying to remove, um, you know, you can make a leaf mold bin, if you will, you're going to have limited diversity in there because you're just, you're limiting what you're bringing in, right? You don't have that layer of soil that's already decomposed things. Um, you're also generally using like most of the time we're not going out and getting leaf litter from our native forests that haven't been touched. I have done that in the past. Like that is something that we used to use to mulch the cannabis with, but it's yeah. because it was convenient and I wasn't hiking bales of hay two miles up the hill on my back to my gorilla grow, right? Yeah. So it was use what's around you. Um, yeah. That being said, when we remove leaf litter from our native forests, we are doing damage to our forests. Yeah. Uh, so I, I tend to really take a hard line on that now where I don't recommend doing that. If you can avoid it, avoid it. Um, that's kind of why these boxes of rice, this KNF technique is, is good because we can capture some of that diversity. There is debate, of course, on how much we're getting. And I am not a mycologist, nor am I a microbiologist. So I don't know what I'm collecting in there. I do know that my soil has increased in its health exponentially since I started doing KNF. I do know that I use way less fertilizer than I've ever used um, from doing KNF. I do know that I see things that I can't identify, but again, I'm not, you know, a mycologist. Um, and I do know that I am sending pictures to my friends who are mycologists and having these discussions with them. And, you know, yeah. there's debate. Are we collecting endomycorrhizal species or not? Are we collecting, you know, this, that, or the other one? Um, but the more we learn about how we think now that the soil food web works, uh, we now think that, you know, even these, more aggressive decomposers are still a really good thing to add to our soils because they're still creating more nutrients. So um, I, I hope that kind of answers that. Um, yeah, and then the, the second question, mm -hmm. what was that Noah? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, I apologize. No, all good, all good. Um, I forgot the second my, question. My second, second. <laughs> my second question was basically remediating trash construction yes. filter. Yes, I've done that actually. Um, so I had some clients in Sacramento that their backyard, I went in because they were trying to start, um, you know, they wanted to do some Hugo cultures and they were like, but we don't really know, like, do we dig down? Do we go up? Like, what are we doing? And, and we think that there's like, you know, parts of this was cement or something. And so I went with the, um, tensometer which is a, a basically it's a 
T-shaped thing with a pressure gauge on the top of it. And you push it down and when it hits a compaction layer, it'll register. And I mean, their, their compaction layers worked. <laughs> I was like, oh, you do have buried cement. And then we were digging on like, oh, that's not cement. That's just gnarly filter within like an inch in parts of their garden. And um, so one thing that we did do was we had them hugel up on that area. So instead oh. of digging down, we created a hugel mound on top of that compaction layer. And it was amazing. I went back. Um, I think it was at the end of the year, I, it might, it was somewhere in like nine months or so that I was back in Sacramento area and they were like, dude, you have to stop by. This is incredible. So yeah. I went over and I was just like, I brought my meter and I was like, what happened to the compaction there? They're like, right. It's just gone. Like, it's so cool. Um, and, uh, and so you can, you can go up, um, if you don't really the easiest way is to go up because when you're hitting that, that trash fill dirt, it's full of rocks. It's full of, I mean, there's plastic in it sometimes. Yeah, it's, there's, it's, it's just, it really. Two beds in my greenhouse. And I, it, I was like, God, why am I digging this out? There has to be a way. And in my greenhouse, I'm limited on height. So I, I had no option. I dug about, I think I got 24 inches down by the time I started hitting natural clay. It was wow. like 18 to 24 inches before I started hitting natural clay. I think it, closer to 18, but God, I, I was just like, this is insane. I'm going to have, much, how much rock was there? Was there a oh, lot of it, rock in it? Oh yeah. Huge river boulders. Yeah. I mean, it was, I destroyed two shovels. I couldn't even get a rototiller or anything through there. Cause it was just breaking off teeth and snapping tines. Like I was just like, okay, if I big, if I dig this hole big enough and just lace it with microbes and biology, my hopes are that it spreads out to the rest of the ground and breaks up that compaction layer. Otherwise, it's just going to be digging holes for years and years and years. <laughs> yeah, and and it will do that, and it'll do that faster than than you think it will. Like it can go pretty quickly depending on how much inoculant you put in and how much organic material. The rocks you still have to deal with. Like those don't yep. disappear in any you know human time frame whatsoever. Um, no. But you can just add organic material and kind of double dig. So dig it to shovel out, put in organic, you know, put it back. Okay. Um, believe it or not, so we used to back in the day. I mean, the uh, the other option would be doing a light depth so your plants don't need to be as tall their nutrient cycling is less because they have a shorter cycle so yep. inside of your greenhouse building a secondary structure that you can pull tarps on if yep. you want to go down that path you know well, if you can really, go down that path i got one of those light depth greenhouses from patrick so i'm set up nice. on the horse green yeah oh, and yeah you did yep and that's next season so i'm, I'm yep. i wanted to fill that thing up this year so next season i'm like okay let's implement the light depth and see if we can get two or three harvests out of the season and go from there and keep them shorter, like you're saying. Yeah. Yep. And then maybe so I with can... that, with that light up, um, you know, the thing is cannabis roots don't really go that deep. They, they go out, they go laterally more than they go horizontally. Yeah. So you don't need as much soil as you think you need. People are like, we well, need two feet. I'm like, dude, 18 inches. If you're gonna light up or do a quick turn and burn with an indoor, you don't really need more than 18 inches. Now more mm -hmm. is better and you wanna yeah. start building towards that more, but to right. start with, and especially if you're in ground, then you know if you can get 18 inches of decent soil on top of whatever it is below it, that biology will start moving down and it will start breaking it up and it will start you know making it accessible. And um, you might need to add rock dust on top of it, like as a top dressing. Once not might James is going to say you do. You're going to need to add rock dust every year um, because that has all those micronutrients and things. You know when we're, we talk a lot about boron, so the salt rock dust has is heavy on the boron side. That helps you with that. Um, the molybdenum, an enemy. I live in an anemone. Yeah, molybdenum uh, that Tim was mentioning, I believe, is in some really good, uh, some different rock dust. So, like, if you can get a few different types of rock dust, glacial rock dust, azomite is a rock dust. Uh, Wallanite is a new one that kind of people have been talking about a lot. Basalt, granite. You know, for me, the the more diverse you can get and the less of it you can use, that means the less impact we're having because most of these rock dusts are coming from mining processes, um, right. which, you know, again, we're, we're kind of 
we're taking our human systems and trying to make them as least impactful as possible with the knowledge that it's impossible to have no impact. Okay. So, right. We're running, we are running so, time. so we have one quick question from Taylor and then I will get you guys out of here. Apologize for the, the running over here. Yeah, no, no worries. I'll be quick. I was just wondering if you had any uh, wild crafting tips that targeted beneficial nematodes. It's a, a hole in the research that I've been doing. I've been looking to, to get to, to wild craft them. Um, or if you have any thoughts on if that's even a, a good, good route to do. What type of nematodes are you trying to wild craft? Omnivorous, I assume, or bacterial and fungal or what? Uh, a little bit of everything. Um, I was like the way I'm kind of looking at this, the, building the soil can, I, like I have techniques that I can target anaerobes, I can target aerobes and saprophytes and things like that. And as mm -hmm. I looked at the entire soil community, um, the only techniques I find that target any type of beneficial nematodes at all would be like, uh, like a waxworm kind of lab, it lab based media tech. Uh, I haven't seen much about, uh, wild crafting, something that maybe targets a beneficial nematode of any sort, um, to be honest. Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of information out there. I agree. I think there is a hole in that research. What I would say is thinking at it from a very common sense perspective, if you feed it, they will come. So if you want fungal feeders, get fungal diversity and fungal dominance. If you want bacterial feeders, get bacterial dominance if you, and bring some in. So either purchasing some and getting them rolling in their own life cycle, and then just scope it out and see if you can keep it rolling. Um, I've, not, I think that we've bought nematodes a few times in the past and I still find omnivorous ones in my compost pile now and then. Not of course at the extent when I put them in there, but um, which I, like, I thought the sponge was bad, so I threw it away. <laughs> well, if you are going out and getting some scoops of uh, forest soil or some you know, leaf litter every now and then, you're collecting those. And if you're getting yeah. that on your soil, then those are gonna propagate out and as long as they have food, you should be getting those in your soil. And if you have a microscope, which if you don't have a microscope, get a microscope, you know, it's a great investment for anyone who's doing this. Um, you'll know what's actually in your soil. So you can you can see those changes over time. Yeah, as a note for the nematodes, uh, I run, you know, indoor soils and I, you know, bring in compost and some diversity from outside. But uh, when I was at the OC conference, uh, John Duke uh, looked at it under a microscope and found four nematodes in one slide initial, like the first poll. So he was like, that's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, so, um, you know, this is a note of an indoor system, how prevalent they can be and how easily they can be brought in, I guess. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that and say that uh, my clients in Colorado, you could not get a sample right. of their soil without finding nematodes in it. There was right. so many nematodes. It was absolutely phenomenal. They're a Korean natural farming facility. And they didn't, I don't believe, actually, no, I'm sure they did not bring in nematodes at that point. And we found them everywhere. Yeah, they're all over, oh. over here. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, my bro, real, real quick note, uh, one more about, um, uh, rebuilding the, uh, the, the construction, so the backfill. Um, so bringing in organic matter is great. Uh, that organic matter typically from estimations like compost only lasts in the soil roughly five to seven years. Um, so the best way to bring carbon into the soil is through root exudates. Uh, and so getting diverse cover crops on there as soon as possible for as long as possible, like uh, from uh, Dr. Jones, that's that was her whole thing. Her 11 and a half, 12 hours of things, that was the summation of it all is, get massive amounts of multi-species roots growing in there and everything happens. The most productive farms that don't use any inputs that have twice the production of their, their, their neighbor uh, chemical farms are farms that just have multi-species diversity, the cover crops. And so, you can use cover crops that mine, cover, cover crops, deep that's roots it. that break up. It's all that, that sugar, that it's that root exudates. Grasses yeah. do a good job of it. Photosynth Photosynthesates. Photosynthesates, yeah. Wendy, James, and Tim, thank you guys so much for, for doing this for me. I really appreciate your time. I know you guys are all super busy. James, Wendy, I know you guys are like right like towards the end of harvest. <laughs> Tim, I mean, you have so many crops a year. We don't even know where you're at. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, everyone, thank you for listening and, uh, and fancying us. Thank you. <laughs>